Hello, this is Pastor Max from Recovery Church. We're going to continue on our, our study of the fourth step. We're in a series called The Path. And in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous's big book, it says, Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. And it, it's at the very beginning of how it works. And so we want to continue uh, helping you along the path. And in this episode, we're going to look at the, some of the specifics of the fourth step. We had uh, a previous episode, uh, our part one on fourth step, and this is our part two where we're going to actually look at some specific questions um, and try to aid you in your uh, as you pursue doing the fourth step. Um, last episode, we talked about when the the um, there's a battleground of our instincts. We're we're given these instincts by God. They're they're natural, but when our um, when we become the battleground for those instincts, there can be no peace. When we have uh, whether it's for material, uh, emotional security, or even uh, sex and just relationships, as, as those instincts are at odds, uh, there can be no peace. Um, the cause of much of our issues, especially in regards to uh, addiction and even in recovery, is our instincts running wild, our instincts not being in their proper uh, perspective and their proper uh way and so they've been out of control and so when they're out of control and we we want to look at them we our instincts are are, are we just kind of we balk at that investigation and so um we also talked about how sobriety or being dry just not drinking not using is not the only thing there's so much more and the fourth step allows us to have more um, and if we can be objective, we can be fearless. Um, the fourth step is, is, is like a heart transplant. We get rid of the bad, and the fourth step gives us a new heart. It awakens what was dead, and um, we, again, are on that path to, as the 12th step says, have a spiritual awakening. So the fourth step says we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves and again this is the step that is can be so challenging um, for people in recovery but it's it's an essential step to success in uh, in in sobriety what is an inventory let's just define what an inventory is it's an itemized list of your current assets it's um, a complete list of items such as property or goods in stock or, um, or their content. So we're going to look at, if we're going to take an inventory, we're going to see what's on the shelves, uh, what's in our, our lives emotionally, and, and you know what, what things are there. Um, this is not, it doesn't say we made a searching and fearless uh, moral autobi autobiography of our lives. Um, this isn't about when I was born or I wasn't held or any of that stuff. This is about what is currently in stock, a complete list of, of what is in stock. And in regards to what's in stock, what, how we emotionally deal with things, how we pursue and let our instincts, um, uh, how they, they act in our lives. Um, are they out of control? Are they... Um, what what are they doing? So tonight's scripture, I want us to take a look at James. We're going to look at James 1, um, verses 13 through 15. Let no one say when they're tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. I think this is a good one, especially for those in recovery. God's not going to test us or tempt us. Um, I think that sometimes we test ourselves. Sometimes we put ourselves in situations, especially when it comes to drinking or drugs. Well, let me see if I can be around my friends. Let me see if I can go to this event and maybe not go with somebody as a, a wingman or someone to help me or a, a way out. And so we, we say, well, maybe God's tempting us to try to see if, if I'll fall. But Never let someone say, according to James, I'm being tempted by God. 
But each person is tempted when they're lured and, and enticed by their own desires. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Listen to that progression. Um, we're enticed by our own desires. That's when we're tempted. And desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. So our desire, we have a desire, and then when it matures, it matures into sin. And then sin, when it's fully grown, brings death. So that's, I think that's an interesting thing um, that we can really take into account. Uh, in the step book, uh, step four talks about seven deadly sins. And I'm going to just listen, list the seven deadly sins. And I think that these are, they say this is a great place to start in regards to our inventory and see how we're doing. There's pride. There's greed. There's lust. There's anger. There's gluttony. There's envy. And there's sloth. Pride Pride so often leads to self-justification. And it's always spurred on by whether it's conscious or unconscious fear. Um, it, and that's the breeder of most of our human difficulties, fear and pride. Pride lures us into making demands which cannot be met. I deserve this. I'm owed this. I'm better than this. So pride lures us into making demands which cannot be met. When the satisfaction of our instincts for sex, for security, or even um, society becomes our sole objective of, that, of our, our lives, pride will step in to justify our, our accesses. You deserve it. You have, these situations are challenging or hard. <coughs> you deserve these things. And then you throw in unreasonable fear. Um, that our instincts won't be satisfied. Um, it drives us when, when, we, when we have this fear that our instincts won't be met. We covet the possession of others. We lust for sex and power. We become angry when our instincts and demands are not met. We become envious when ambition of others are realized. When other people f have success, we envy that success. We eat, we drink, and grab for more of everything than we need, fearing we shall never have enough. In the last episode, I talked about a funny example of how uh, when I would go to fast food restaurants with my father, we would take too many napkins. We would take a stack of napkins just in case. Um, just in case there was a spill, just in case we needed it, in case there was a ketchup emergency. Yet... We really never needed it, but we grabbed for more of everything than we needed. And that's a humorous example, but let me ask you this question. Is there something that you hoard in hopes of having security in your own life? It could be things. It could be money. Um, it could even be relationships. But we hoard things in hopes of, that they will bring security. Um, and sometimes we just we stay lazy and with genuine alarm at the prospect of the work it might take to accomplish something we stay lazy i don't want to go back to school to to learn or get a further degree or even just to get my degree i don't want to stay extra at work or put in uh extra time i just want to be i want to be rewarded but when we see that that's not going to happen, we stay lazy, we loaf, we procrastinate, or at best we work grudgingly or maybe under half steam. Um, I don't know if you've ever had a job, uh, maybe a, a manual labor kind of job. I, those are the kind of jobs I had when, um, when I was first getting jobs and did everything from painting curbs to, uh, you know, raking leaves and those kind of things and sometimes you can be motivated but sometimes uh, you work grudgingly like ah oh, i don't want to be doing this whatever the this is and, and so maybe you complain maybe you work you know not at full steam because they're paying me by the hour what's it matter 
You know, we have a bad attitude, so we, we stay lazy. I don't know if you've ever struggled with that. But fear and pride, whether it's in those situations or others, it beats us back every time we try to look at ourselves. Pride says, you need not pass this way. Everything's fine. And fear says, you dare not look because you don't know what you'll find. So as we try to do this self-examination, as we try to have this inventory, pride says, you don't need to pass this way. Fear says, you dare not look. And so we're left frustrated and without progress. The first fruits of the fourth step is persistence. When we persist, as we persist, this brand new confidence is born. And this sense of relief at finally facing ourselves is indescribable. When we, when we actually uh, start to put pen to paper and we start really examining ourselves, we get this sense of relief. Those are the first fruits of step four. As we persist, my encouragement to you, persist. Don't let fear, don't let pride keep you from the breakthrough and the freedom and the sense of relief that comes from starting this process. We arrive at the following conclusions. Our character defects, it represents our instincts gone astray. Those things, our character defects, those things that come up short. Again, we have those seven deadly sins, but they've been the primary cause of our using and our failure at life. Whether it's pride or greed or, or desire just to be numb. Unless we're willing to work hard at the elimination of the worst of these defects, that honestly, sobriety and peace of mind will elude us. We need to eliminate these defects of character, these rough edges, if we, you will. They need to be smoothed out because they're causing damage, damage in relationships, damage with people we interact with. And if we want to stay sober, if we want to stay on this path and experience, rarely have we seen a person fail who's thoroughly followed our path. We need to work hard at the elimination of the worst of these defects, but we need to know what they are to know how to eliminate them. Sobriety and peace of mind, those are great, great things that we don't want to elude us. The fourth step and progress requires work and change. It's the blueprint to change, the fourth step is, but it, it requires work. But I promise you, it will be worth it. If you do your fourth step, it will be worth it. Another scripture tonight, also from James, comes from James 1, 19 through verses 21. Know this. My beloved brothers and sisters, let every person be quick to hear and slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of someone does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to to save your souls. Put away all filthiness, oh boy, filthiness, and rampant wickedness, ah, those are crazy words, and receive with meekness, in other words, with humility, the word, the implanted word, the, the word that's implanted into our hearts. And this word is able to save our souls. What a strong word from James. As we look at step four, Step four, it, it teaches us how to take an inventory. And this inventory taking is going to be a lifetime practice. First, we look at flaws that are most, the most glaring and troublesome. Lying, stealing, anger. We make a rough survey of our conduct with respect to our primary instincts for security, society, 
uh, sex, th those things that drive us, that have caused trouble, or maybe we haven't realized they cause trouble. I, I want to give, give you some questions to consider as you are delving into the fourth step. These questions will help you as you answer them to really start to make some breakthroughs. When and how, and this is in regards to relationships, and in just what instances did my selfish pursuit of intimacy or even specifically sex damage other people? How have I reacted to frustration in relationships and specifically in regards to intimacy? When I was denied, did I become vengeful or depressed? Did I get angry? Did I take it out on other people? Did we ever snap at someone for no reason at all? Or worse, have you snapped at someone for what you thought was a very valid reason? All of that because our instincts weren't being met. Our desires, our, the thing that we thought we needed, deserved, should have. How did it play out with all relationships? Not just necessarily the person, the specific person we were in relationship with, but were we, when we were at work, did, were we short? When we were in class, did we, um, did we you know, talk negatively to other people? Our shortcomings, fear, greed, possessiveness, pride have done their worst in our lives. Let me pose some more questions. This is about finance and specifically about work. In addition to my drinking and using, what character defects contributed to my financial insecurity? In addition to my using, because clearly when I drank or I used, um, it produced financial insecurity. Uh, we would uh, spend money that maybe we didn't have or spend more money that could have been going to other things rather than the excesses that we were spending on drugs and alcohol. Now, if you're not somebody of great means, you probably had to find where that money was coming from. But let's take that out of the question. What other ways did um, our defects contribute to my own financial insecurity? Was I so fearful um, of, of an outcome? Would I spend money to alter that outcome? Would I um, shore up things so you know uh, that it brought out other financial insecurity? Here's another question to consider. Did fear and inferiority about the fitness of, for my job destroy my confidence and fill me with conflict. If I was struggling, if you were struggling, if we were struggling at our work, did, did I start to think, I'm not good enough, I, I don't deserve this job, or they're gonna fire me any day now. And then it was filled with conflict, and how could we do our job very well if we're thinking, I, you know, I'm not doing this well, or I'm afraid, I'm afraid of the new person, new person came in, they're going to get all my accounts, or, um, you know, I, I, I'm not doing well, so other people must be doing well. And so we, we were really conf uh, filled with conflict. Here's another great question. Did I try to cover up those feelings of inadequacy? But, because honestly, if, if you struggle with drugs and, and uh, alcohol, more than likely you have on some level struggled with the feeling of not being enough, of being inadequate. Did we cover up those feelings of inadequacy by bluffing, cheating, lying, or evading responsibility? When we didn't feel like we were good enough, did we um, make up a story? Did we, when we thought we weren't good enough on a test, did we cheat just because we wanted to make sure um, that we, we got a good enough grade because we were too afraid of what would happen if I just took this test and, and just uh, see what would happen without anything aiding me. Um, would we not take responsibility in group work or within our family or those because we weren't feeling good enough? And so we would sort of evade that responsibility so that no one would find out that maybe we were in fact inadequate. Here's another question. Did I gripe that others didn't recognize my truly exceptional abilities? 
many an alcoholic or drug addict have said, you just don't understand how gifted I am, how talented I am. And maybe it's hard because you were drunk or high. Or maybe you showed up at work and you were always on time, but you'd been out partying all night. Really, were you that useful early in the morning after nights like that? But I never missed work. Um, people just don't recognize my ability. I should be able to do whatever I want. I should be able to come and go as I please because I'm so gifted. Did we overvalue ourselves and play the big shot? Oh, I'll, I'll buy this round. I got you. Oh, no, I, I got the bill. I'm a big shot. I know what I'm doing, even though we really couldn't afford to. Were we extravagant? Um, you know, with our spending, with our, uh, you know, our vacations, with things at our house, only to really, um, you know, run up debt, but all to show others, I've got what it takes. Was I reckless? Did I borrow money with no intention of ever paying it back? I got in a pinch or I needed um, to buy more of either drugs, um, alcohol, so, you know, but I needed some money and I borrowed, but I, I was never going to pay it back. Or did we become misers? Were we cheap? I love um, many addicts and alcoholics. When they have money and they're flush, oh boy, are they you know, so generous and extravagant. But as soon as it dries up or it looks like it's going to dry up, they, they, we become cheap and miserly. Oh, we don't need to leave a tip. That, that wasn't necessary. You know, the service wasn't that good. Um, but we become cheap instead of, so we go back and forth. It's that Jekyll and Hyde. Did we cut corners financially on things like our taxes or expense reports or credit cards at home, strategically hiding our purchases? Um, if you work at a job where you have an expense report, did you maybe pad it a little bit so that you could maybe drink or buy drugs? Or maybe you, you bought um, alcohol on the the expense report, or maybe you spent secretly on credit cards and maybe when those Amazon boxes came, you made sure you got them before your spouse saw them. Um, all things that sort of uh, we need to examine in regards to fi our finance and work. Um, emotional insecurity. The most common symptom of emotional insecurity are worry, anger, self-pity, and depression. If you have worry, more than likely you have emotional insecurity. If you flare up with anger, especially easily, there might be some emotional insecurity. If you have self-pity, woe is me, you might have some emotional insecurity. If you struggle with depression, you get down. And I'm not talking about the chemical depression, but we get depressed about our situation, depressed emotionally about the things in our lives. We might have some emotional insecurity. Insecurities may rise in any area where our instincts are threatened. If we think that we may lose something or not get something that we deserve, our insecurities rise. And, uh, and they really, they, they make things very challenging because we are emotionally insecure in those areas. Let me ask a couple more questions um, as we're getting ready to sort of land the plane here. Why do I lack the ability to accept conditions I cannot change? What? I, I'll use politics as a great one. Um, Politics are very divided right now. And many people are very emotionally vested in them and can get very worked up about them. And, and there's not to say that having political discourse is not good, but if we vote and we've done that and maybe even go to a rally or something, I, I, but do we really accept the conditions that we can't change? I voted, was that enough? Well, I better argue with everyone online and I'm going to convince them, which never seemed to convince anyone ever. Um, 
Are we able to accept conditions we can't change? We can't change other people. We can't necessarily change the landscape of, uh, in that scenario. If the actions of others are part of the cause of my insecurity, what can I do about it? Are there things I can do and I can position myself um, that I won't take the bait, whether it's a political debate, whether it's a, a conflict with a family member um, or even someone at work? What can I do about it to keep my, my peace in my mind? Am I willing to do what it takes to shape my life to conditions as they are? My job? Probably not going to change a lot unless I change jobs. Is that an option? Maybe. Maybe that's something you need to consider. But no job's perfect. Um, but more likely, how can I change to meet the conditions as they are? Um, whether that's in a relationship. I'm not getting everything out of this relationship that I think I should. Well, am I just going to cut and run like this isn't worth working for? Or am I going to change to meet the conditions of the relationship? The truth is, we have twisted relationships, whether it's with family, friends, and the world at large. And who has suffered? We have suffered the most with, because of our twisted relationships. And the truth is, in those areas, we've been especially just stupid and stubborn when it comes to twisted relationship. The primary fact that we fail to recognize that we have this total inability to form a true partnership with a, uh, another human being is something that we need to grasp. We have an inability to form a true partnership. So often we want to see what are we going to get out of this? Um, what, what, how can I benefit rather than a true partnership? If and when we lean too heavily on people, they will sooner or later fail us. Now, a lot of this is based on ego. Our egomania digs two disastrous pitfalls for us. We insist upon uh, dominating the people we know, we control, we want everything the way we desire it, and then everything will be okay if they just acted the way we desired it. Or maybe we depend upon them far too much. Well. Uh, they need to do these things for me. They need to take care of me. They need to guide me. And so our ego, it's whether it's about dominating others or our ego, that we need to be taken care of. We need to be shown. We have not once sought to be just one in a family or a friend among friends or a worker among workers, to be a useful member of society. That's never been our aim, but maybe it needs to be. How can I be one in a family? How can I be a friend among friends? Not the, the best friend, the greatest friend. How can I be a worker among workers? How can I, I blend in and, and support and assist others? Always we have tried to struggle to the top of the heap or hide underneath it. Self-centered behavior blocked a partnership a partnership relationship with anyone, whether work or in the family. Thoroughness ought to be our watchword when we are doing the fourth step. This will be um, the evidence of our complete willingness to move forward. James 2, this is our final scripture tonight. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. When we extend mercy to others, it triumphs. It triumphs over judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Our own judgment, our judgment of others. We made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. We've made an itemized list of our current assets, a complete list of items and contents that are in stock. That's what an inventory is. My encouragement to you is 
Again, this is not something you do by yourself. Um, you might need some alone time, but you need someone who will walk through this process with you and assist you. Um, but this inventory will bring about incredible freedom and a incredible sense of relief. Be persistent, be willing, be open to this process because the four step, my experience has been, will change your life. And with that in mind, we never want this opportunity to leave um, without giving you the opportunity for life change, for connecting, for acting on this. Tonight, we, we talked about four step of making a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Know that God created you with instincts, but also created you to be in relationship with him. Our sins, a lot of the things that we'll be looking at, those, those seven deadly sins in the four step, those are the things that have separated us from God, separated us from a holy God. And sin, those, those things that we've done, they can't be removed by good deeds. There's a price, but paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. He paid the price. And everyone who trusts in him alone will have eternal life. And eternal life starts right now and goes on forever. I encourage you, as you go on this journey of the four step again, do it with someone you trust, whether it's a pastor or a sponsor, and go through this process, but do a fearless and searching inventory of ourselves and when you come out on the other side many times the 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 obsession to drink or use my experience and some of the promises we'll examine in the the fifth step said that that obsession to use will be lifted it comes from the fourth step and the fifth step so God bless you. May you go on this journey. Embrace it. It is worthwhile. Um, Recovery Church, we love you. And Recovery Church, remember, it's about 12 steps and one goal. God bless, and we'll see you next time.